This unit covers ultrasound in the first trimester, all topics, and components of fetal biometry, and sonographic dating in second and third trimester. Professional societies recommend first trimester ultrasound for several reasons, including confirming pregnancy, assessing pelvic pain and potential ectopic pregnancy, determining gestational age, identifying multifetal pregnancies, and verifying cardiac activity. First trimester ultrasound can aid in uterine procedures, assess fetal malformations and abnormalities of the ovary or uterus, and screen for fetal aneuploidy and H. mole. Other detailed indications include evaluating threatened or incomplete abortions, determining pregnancy status before termination, performing diagnostics, and assessing the status of the amnion and chorion in multiple pregnancies. This picture depicts the maternal ovary just before ovulation, where a ring called the cumulus oophorus is visible within the graphene follicle GF. This ring contains the oocyte. The ruptured GF is known as the corpus luteum, which is a thin-walled cyst with blood flow surrounding it, as shown by the color Doppler. The corpus luteum produces both progesterone and a small amount of estrogen, which helps stimulate the growth of the endometrial lining. At 12 weeks and 3 days, this ultrasound shows a corpus luteum present in the left ovary. Here is a visual representation of the blastocyst. The image illustrates that the blastocyst is made up of two layers of cells, the outer layer called the trophoblast, which will eventually develop into the placenta, and the inner layer, which will develop into the embryo, amnion, umbilical cord, and yolk sac. As the embryo develops, it goes through several stages. Around the eighth week, the heart takes on a definite shape, by the tenth week, the peripheral vascular system is fully formed. Between 8 to 12 weeks, the midgut moves into the base of the umbilical cord. By the ninth week, the third and lateral ventricles are formed, and the fingers become more distinct. Around the tenth week, the anal membrane opens. Additionally, the kidneys move up from the pelvis around the eighth week and reach their final position by the eleventh week. The first indication of a pregnancy in the uterus is the presence of a small gestational sac that can be viewed through transvaginal ultrasound. This typically occurs around 4 to 5 weeks into the pregnancy, with an average sac diameter of 2.5 mm. The sac is expected to be circular, and located next to the endometrial lining without disrupting its shape. It is generally found in the middle to upper portion of the uterus, and is slightly off-center. The chorionic cavity is enclosed by a hyperechoic layer of tissue about 2 to 3 mm thick, formed by the growing chorionic villi. The discriminatory beta subunit of human chorionic gonadotropin, HCG, level is the value above which an intrauterine gestational sac is seen consistently by ultrasound. This level is typically noted to be between 1,000 and 2,000 milli international units per milliliter. However, it is important to note that a single HCG level cannot accurately determine if the pregnancy is normal, ectopic, or non-viable. Maternal HCG levels should be monitored in cases where the pregnancy location is uncertain. Beta HCG is produced by trophoblastic cells and can be detected by day 23. Its levels double every 2 to 3 days, plateau at 8 weeks, and decrease at around 14 weeks. Based on the characteristics of the image, it is more likely to show endometrial fluid rather than a gestational sac. The fluid appears to have a pointed edge and is located centrally within the endometrium, rather than having an oval shape and being eccentrically located. The increased echo surrounding the anechoic sac could indicate decidualization, and it is important to rule out the possibility of an ectopic pregnancy. At four weeks gestation, an ultrasound shows the gestational sac. Within the sac is a secondary yolk sac opposite the amniotic cavity. Between them lies the embryonic disc, also known as the epiblast. This epiblast will later form the definitive embryo and fetus. The extra embryonic coelom becomes the chorionic cavity, the space between the amnion and chorion. By approximately 14 weeks, the chorionic cavity typically vanishes, and the amnion-chorion membrane fuses and is at the margin of the amniotic sac. 
This sac holds the amniotic fluid called the bag of water. This ultrasound image shows the decidua capsularis and decidua parietalis, also known as the double decidual sign. The yolk sac is also visible, typically the first structure seen during an intrauterine pregnancy. If the patient has accurate dates, cardiac motion can be detected after 5 weeks and 5 days, while the presence of a yolk sac is first visible at 5 weeks 1 day to 5 weeks 7 days. The MSD, mean sac diameter, reaches 20 mm. When the embryonic heartbeat is first detected, increasing to 30 mm when embryo movements are present. The number of yolk sacs usually corresponds to the number of amnions, and the yolk sac number helps assess amnion numbers in multiple gestations. The diameter of the yolk sac increases between 5 to 10 weeks, reaching a maximum of about 6 mm. The measurement of the yolk sac is usually taken from the inner wall to the inner wall. A gestational sac can be identified at 5 weeks during a transvaginal ultrasound. The yolk sac has an echogenic periphery with a sonolucent center, and its detection confirms that the intrauterine fluid represents an intrauterine pregnancy. At 13 weeks and 1 day, an ultrasound image shows the amnion and chorion. The chorion comes from a different source than the amnion, as the blastocyst's outer cell layer forms the chorionic membranes, while the inner layer forms the amnion. These two layers usually merge at around 14 weeks. Normally, the visualization of the amnion happens after the yolk sac. At 12 weeks and 3 days, an ultrasound was taken to capture a nuchal translucency image. It's worth noting the position of the amnion, which is closest to the fetus, while the chorion, not seen, would be nearer to the uterine wall. At around 6 menstrual weeks, this ultrasound demonstrates a typical gestational sac with an embryo, yolk sac, and amnion. To count the number of embryos, it's important to conduct a thorough survey of the gestational sac from both anterior, posterior, and transverse angles. Seen with transvaginal ultrasound at about 5 weeks, the normal yolk sac is composed of three layers, ectodermal, mesodermal, and endodermal, and begins to regress after the seventh week, while the maximum diameter of the yolk sac, from 5 to 10 weeks is 5 mm to 6 mm. During the 6-10 to 10 week period of a normal pregnancy with a detected heartbeat, a deformed or absent yolk sac should not be present. In a typical situation, the yolk sac, heart rate, and amniotic membrane, amnion, appear sequentially. During a normal pregnancy, the yolk sac typically reaches a maximum size of 8.1 mm. In the first trimester, the heart rate and yolk sac diameter gradually increase. Diagnosis of an intrauterine pregnancy occurs if a yolk sac or gestational sac is seen, with or without a fetal pole, or a fetal pole is seen, with or without a heart rate. This schematic drawing demonstrates the following, a. Gestational sac, b. Crown rump length of the embryo, c. Amniotic sac, and d. Yolk sac. During the first trimester exam, M mode is activated as part of ultrasound instrumentation to facilitate visualization of cardiac activity. M mode is a time motion measurement that uses a linear cursor positioned on a two dimensional display. The resulting tracing of information is displayed over time. This heart view shows a common M mode image, which is usually obtained by placing the cursor in subcostal or apical four chamber views. In this particular case, the fetal heart rate has been confirmed to be 146 beats per minute. This ultrasound showcases the tracking of the fetal heart rate through M-mode documentation. This is the end of part 1 for the first trimester course. To earn continuing education credits, you must finish part 2 and complete the quiz.